Good morning everyone and thank you very much for joining us today for our first webinar in our legal series on network security. My name is Russell Barley and I am the founder of Prodec Networks. As it's such an important topic, I take a special interest in network security and our partnership with Palo Alto Networks. I'm delighted to be joined today by Will Matthews from Palo Alto Networks, who will be taking the majority of this webinar to speak to you about the importance of network security for legal firms. Before I hand over to Will, I wanted to give you a brief introduction to Prodec Networks. Uh, Prodec Networks was uh, formed back in uh, the beginning of uh, 1996 and uh, employs over 60 people. Uh, our, we're part of the Barstone group of companies and our combined turnover is now £25 million per annum. There are a number of companies in the Barstone group. Um, Prodec Networks is one of them. They all involve uh, around the security and network arena within IT. Um, we have um, a hosting company, we have a maintenance company, we have a supply company, which is Product Networks, and we have an inf infrastructure company as well. But today I'm just going to concentrate briefly on Product Networks. Um, really the key areas that we are involved with in Product Networks are security, uh, with firewalls, and our preferred best of breed choice is Palo Alto Networks, which as far as we're concerned, and I think the industry would agree, is the only next generation firewall in the marketplace today, as Will will allude to later. Also, uh, we specialize heavily in servers and storage, uh, really concentrating with HP and Dell as our primary uh, vendors there. The next is networks. Uh, in this case, Cisco takes a pretty major uh, part of our um, portfolio with routing, switching, wireless. There are other manufacturers as well, best of breed in certain aspects, which we'll see later. And lastly, unified communications, really to do with voice uh, and uh, video and connectivity. We also have um, our own ISP uh, as well, so we can offer Ethernet circuits, uh, DSL circuits, and very interestingly, uh, opportunities with 3G and 4G, um, which could be very useful uh, in certain applications. Uh, really, this is just a, a brief uh, shot of some of the uh, manufacturers that we have relationships with, and that we are we consider as best of breed in the areas in which we cover. Uh, I think that's really all I have to say for now. Uh, thank you very much and I'm going to hand you over to uh, Will who can talk about uh, Palo Alto Networks. Thank you. Thanks a lot Russell. Uh, hopefully everyone can hear me. I'm waiting just to switch over the screens. There. How's that? Can everyone see that okay? Not once for yes, twice for no. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Jolly good, thank you. <laughs> right, so hi, my name is Will Matthews. I'm one of the system engineers for Palo Alto Networks here in the UK. What I'm going to do is give you a brief overview of Palo Alto Networks give you some insight into what makes us different, what makes our, our product uh, separate from the others. Uh, I'll give you a warning, I used to work for Checkpoint Software Technologies and Tipping Point, and I tend to use those guys as sort of references, I need not, not for any particularly competitive reason other than I, I know those technologies pretty well and I, I use them as a comparison because they're, they're pretty widely used. Um, so I assume that people have heard the name a little bit. Uh, we were set up by a guy called Nizog, and he was one of the he's one of the uh, names on the patent for statement inspection. Statement inspection was a technology developed by Checkpoint back in 1993, and that's kind of an interesting thing straight off the bat. Um, statement inspection is a technology that's widely used. It's in pretty much every firewall you can buy on the market today. Um, what makes it interesting is that 
it doesn't matter whether it's from Checkpoint, Sonic War, Fortinet, Cisco, Juniper, they all basically use a staple inspection firewall. And all staple inspection does for people is manage ports. And that technology has not changed for 15 years. So the second point there is that technology hasn't shifted on for 15 years. And the reason why Palo Alto has been so successful, why you know now we have around 12,000 customers globally, um, I think 40 or 50 of which are on million dollar customers. If you, uh, if you go to very famous online bookstores, very famous online um, social networking sites, very famous uh, auction sites, you, you'll find that you're probably passing through a Palo Alto network spiral. The reason for that success is is down to how how different um, our firewall is from pretty much any other firewall on the market. There's no, you know, if you were to hold up a, a PDF from one vendor and put it next to a, a checkpoint, put it next to a Palo Alto, put it next to a Juniper, and that sort of thing, it's very difficult to see off the bat using a PDF as a as a mechanism for comparing what features of firewall does or doesn't have. So until you get down to it, once you, you sort of get one in your hands, people begin to appreciate the, the very real difference between our technologies and everything else out there. It's also important to point out that while staple inspection is used um, predominantly in firewalls, it's also used in a lot of other technologies too. So you know, you've got things like URL filters out there, you've got um, IPS, IDS technologies, all based on staple inspection as well. So we'll briefly explain what that means in a moment. Um, just to touch on Palo Alto itself. So set up in 2005 by Nizuk, who was the one of the patent holders, like I say, of state of inspection. He also was part of One Secure, which was one of the first IPS technologies. He went on to uh, become a CTO at Juniper. Uh, and at Juniper he was he wanted to build a next generation firewall. And he asked, well, you know, can I have several million dollars, some engineers, and I'll, I'll deliver you a firewall, the likes of which no one's ever seen before. And Juniper said, no, sorry, I uh, would much rather you uh, convert Screenos to Junos. Um, Neil wasn't too interested in that. He went out, he got venture capitalist money from Sequoia and Greylock, and set up Palo Alto Networks. Got his engineers, and for two years, didn't you? And in 2007, we started shipping products. Like I say, we're now 12,000 uh, customers globally, we've got 1,000 employees. We are a, a unique technology in the marketplace. But like I say, it's very difficult to sort of see that. Um, and so why are we different? So the crux of Palo Alto is its ability to identify applications. When I'm talking about applications, I'm not talking about desktop widgets or Facebook apps or stuff like that. What I'm talking about is network communication protocols. So, you know, we would consider something like SMTP or Telnet or FTP, Oracle traffic, you name it, in the same way that we consider Dropbox, YouTube, Twitter. They're just forms of communication. Um, one of the things that we've done exceptionally well is allow people to safely enable these applications. So let me explain what that is. So App ID um, is different from any other firewall, simply because it does a couple of things. First of all, most firewalls are port bound. Most firewalls out there expect things like LDAP traffic to be on port 389, they expect SSL to be on port 443, they expect NCP to be on port 123. You know, they, they, everything that a traditional state inspection technology does is hinges around either the TCP port or the UDP port. They expect certain types of traffic to be on certain types of ports. And there's no, no leeway in that sort of logic. What Palo Alto has done is build a firewall that doesn't care about the port numbers. Port numbers are no way these days of identifying correctly an application that's actually going across the firewall. What Palo does is there are 65,535 TCP and UDP ports um, that we monitor all the time. So our firewall sits there in the traffic monitors all those 65,535 ports and identifies the traffic not on its port number but actually on the application of data. So I'll give you an example. If you were to run SSH across port 10,000, our file will go on the floor. That's SSH across port 10,000. If I was to run SSH across port 443, then our file will go, look, that's SSH across port 443. That differs quite dramatically from the other files out there. If you run, uh, I'll use SSH again, or we could say LDAP, we could say pretty much anything. If we run 
uh, SSH cross port 443 on a traditional old fashioned firewall based on 15 year old technology, it will merrily say that that is SSL. It won't positively identify the application. If you were to run SSH across port 10,000 or LWAP across port 12,000, Oracle across whatever, um, it will just say, right, that's TCP. It has no ability to figure out what type of application it's actually going to cross there. So that's the first thing that separates our firewall from anything else out there. It's monitoring all the ports all the time and positively identifying the applications that go across. From a security point of view, that's incredibly valuable because the firewall sees absolutely everything and is looking to figure out what absolutely everything is. So, you know, data leakage, uh, command and control sessions, perhaps by hackers, users trying to abuse the firewall, find it much more difficult uh, to sneak past the firewall that is monitoring all those ports. The other thing that we've done is, is what we're looking at the screen here, is that, you know what, Facebook, Twitter, WebEx, those sort of applications are essentially just methods of communication. Now that's, that's kind of a, a revolutionary statement, because if you, if you go and talk to anyone about competitors, the, the point of view that they have is Facebook is a threat, Rapid Share is a threat, Usendit.com is a threat, these are, these are problems to be killed. What Palo Alto says is quite different. So what Palo Alto says is we want to safely enable those. So at the end of the day, you know, Facebook chat as an application is just a way of sharing data. It's just a way of sharing information between two people. You're not particularly afraid of people sharing information across Facebook chat. What you are afraid of is what might be inside that. You know, in the same way that you know, you send it .com is not inherently bad. Um, you know, what you might be afraid of is someone sending an executable or sending some proprietary data or accidentally sending out information that should not be leaving the organization. So what Palo Alto's story with those sort of web 2.0 applications, those next generation applications, is that we will safely enable those for you. you know, if we roll the clock back, if we go back 15 years and I say to people, do you want to allow SMTP in and out of the network willy-nilly without any sort of care in the world, people say absolutely not. Absolutely not. We want to allow SNTP communication between this host and that host, but I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to have viruses. I don't want to have executables going across there. I want to make sure it's synchronized on it. That sort of stuff. That's precisely the same message that we use when we talk about Facebook or when we talk about WebEx or when we talk about any of these other applications coming across there. Now, so that's good. Uh, if you're going to offer all that sort of stuff, if you're going to offer um, you know, controls over Gmail and, uh, and Google have a fifty or applications now that fall into category. Um, if you're going to do that, you have to do SL encryption. That's one of the things that we've also done. One of the also the other things you'll notice about these applications is that they want to live. You know, the, the, the likes of Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and, and Google and whatever else, they um, want to get their applications across the network. So this goes back to the point that um, you know, safety inspection is a 15 year old technology. It's not changed for 15 years, but the internet has changed, you know, immeasurably. In 1993, when state inspection was first invented, there was no web, for instance, let alone no SSL, let alone no uh, sort of that sort of stuff. So it's absolutely essential to have a firewall that can control these things. It's absolutely essential to have a firewall that can allow organisations to make use of them. You know, how else can organisations safely send 600 meg files? How else can organisations who have large numbers of um, home workers keep up some sort of social communication between that stuff. But these applications are absolutely essential, but you know, being able to control them is it's paramount as well. So our poll sees your traffic, um, it enables or safely enables these applications and allows us to give greater granular control over them. That's because things have, have changed fairly dramatically. You know, like I say, going back to pre-1993, um, things are far more simple. You know, you could almost be certain of what was going across the port was actually what was going across the port. Um, and now I've already said that applications have changed. Facebook chat um, is purely instant messenger with bells and whistles on. Um, Rapid share is just FTP with bells and whistles on. You, know, you send it as FTP. You know, these applications aren't terribly different to what we've used for in the past. The only thing is now is that the application developers have recognized faults within staple inspection, typically in the way it handles HTTP traffic, 
and they sort of abuse it. The other element of abuse that you know is the malware writers, the, the hackers, the, you know, the people who write the, the bad stuff out there on the internet. They change their track too. They understand, perhaps unlike in, in 1993, they they nowadays fully understand what ports will be available, what applications will be available, what uh, what what will actually be on the network. And if you can't control those in a in a meaningful way. Um, it's, it's very difficult to actually apply any sense of security or any sense of management or visibility of that. So applications are also a threat vector. You know, here you know, we're talking about them being a, a useful tool, a useful utility on the network. Here we're looking at the, the problems associated with it. That's very much how, how Palo Alto positions itself. Final bit is, you know, things like in data center communications and that sort of stuff. But the punchline is, is that the internet's changed, the users have changed, the hackers have changed, you know, application developers have all changed. Everything's changed. Um, the difference being that the actual firewall vendors and the security vendors haven't changed one iota, and they're still largely based on the unwritten rule that. Whatever goes across port four one three is SSL. Whatever goes across port one two three is NTP, and that's wrong. We know it's wrong. All of using that wrong just seems a little odd that the the people that you you pay vast sums of money to in renewals and that sort of thing over the year don't seem to think that that is wrong. Um, and that's pretty much where where Palo Alto comes into play. Um, encrypted applications unseen by the firewall. Now my boss near does say that the firewall can't control. Um, protocols or sessions going to a firewall, then is it really a firewall? Um, you, you pay an awful lot of money for these things to sort of shepherd stuff in and out of the in and out of the network. Um, and if it can't actually do that, if it can't actually put controls on email going out and file sharing and all that sort of stuff, is it is it really a firewall? Um, I don't think that's a fair comment. Um, I think the answer is a the fairly numbers. No, no, it's not. Um, encrypted applications do play a large part. Now what Palo Alto does is we gather a large amount of data from networks. We try to encourage people to have a POC, a what we call a proof of concept evaluation, whereby you put it on your network and you know all this stuff that I'm sort of spouting, um, you can you can see for yourself and you actually get to try it out for your own rights. Um, you know, we gather that information. So we gather the information in our firewall sort of goes, okay, I've seen I don't know, Oracle twenty thousand times, I've seen SAP thirteen thousand times, I've seen uh, Dropbox, whatever number of times. So it gathers this information into a tiny little database, and then we dump all that information into a into a much larger database, and it gives us a feedback of how people are really using networks. Now, first of all, that's kind of interesting. There have been um, um, tests or uh, interviews in the past where you know data has been gathered by phoning up network administrators and sort of saying to them, you know, what what goes through your firewall, and they'll you know, guess. Typically, because they don't have that kind of visibility with the policy out, they'll guess that HTTP and SMTP are internet. Our data is based on the actual network traffic that our firewall sees. Um, from that, we see around about 40% of all traffic that goes through any given firewall um, is either SSL encrypted, port hops, i.e., you know, if it can't get out in this TCP port number, it'll try a different port number, or try a different port number, and so on and so forth. So it does actually get out, or a combination of both. So while you know some vendors now have included SSL inspection on uh, on standard sort of ports, they haven't included it right away across the 65,535 ports available, and they're probably oblivious to the types of applications that also do that. I think it's quite well unusual. Most people. So sort of recognise that BitTorrent, LimeWire, that sort of thing, port up quite aggressively. Um, they also, most people have sort of wrestled with their with their traditional firewalls, trying to control something like Skype, which uh, you know obviously doesn't even have a have a port number associated with it. Um, but it's stuff like iTunes uh, and other applications that, you know, simply by design and for perfectly legitimate reasons, I suppose, if you're if you're the application developer, perfectly by design, want to get through the network. You know, at the end of the day, Facebook want to sell their applications and their services and their marketing to to corporate users. Uh, the same for Microsoft applications, same for Apple uh, applications. That's all. And it makes absolute sense to make sure that those those stuff do make it through the firewall unhindered. Um, and again, we go back to the argument of you know, if a firewall can't control apps, then what actually is the point of it? So 
Encrypted applications are unseen by the firewall. That stands to reason. Um, our firewall does have the ability to decrypt traffic going across it. So that's really the nub of, of app ID, our, our core technology. We install ports all the time. Um, we treat Web 2.0 like it was a regular network application, and we decrypt SSL to be able to allow you to see inside. And we can do that very selectively. I don't want to people to sort of sit and think, oh, no, I don't want to decrypt absolutely every little bit of SSL. We have a corporate policy that allows people to say, I don't know, use Gmail, that's a good example, use Gmail uh, or MS uh, Outlook, whatever they call it now, or Hotmail as it was, um, that sort of thing. If you have a corporate policy that says, right, you cannot send a file with this particular code within it or this particular confidential word or this particular custom name in it via those mechanisms, then our firewall has the ability to sort of sit there and say, right, um, we, we can monitor that traffic and safely enable it. So the whole point of safely enabling is that, is that control that we provide using the FID technology. So, wonderful, so that's the FID. Um, now, one of the other problems with traditional firewalls has been that fundamentally, you know, we get the benefit of doubt. If we go back, let's go back 10 years. So if we go back 10 years, uh, you would go out and you spend an awful lot of money on a firewall, you'd put it on the network, and if you were savvy, uh, sort of IT administrator, you would recognize the flaws within that firewall. Uh, firewalls need, traditional firewalls need an awful lot of support and help to do any form of proper security. Um, so you, as a, as, a, as a potential customer, have been left with a, a couple of options. First option was this sort of model, and this is what most people most people who are bought into they they buy a firewall. Uh, they recognise that firewalls traditionally have not been terribly good at, at blocking network threats. Shutting protocol protocols no problem. Blocking threats was a big issue. So then there a whole market of IPS um, sprung up, uh, probably born out of the IDS market, but looking for threats uh, and helping the firewall deal with stuff that inherently couldn't do. Um, there was DLP. You know, typically in this sort of scenario, DLP was monitoring data in transit, um, you know, that whole thing of, well, how can data leak from my organization? But I couldn't do it. But I did not have the processing power, the memory, the you know, functionality, whatever you want to call it, to be able to control data leakage. Um, instant messaging probably wasn't so big. There was a market for it in the UK that began to control web-based application of instant messaging. Was, it was kind of antivirus. Now, antivirus is an enormously interesting topic for us right now, we released a technology called Wildfire, um, which we're not going to talk about too much today. But again, you know, firewalls traditionally have not been able to to deal with viruses. You know, it's not one of their core functions. And to be able to deliver it, you've had to buy into perhaps third-party technologies. Again, for URL filtering, and again for proxying, all this stuff was fine. Now, you know, people would spend an awful lot of money on one or two uh, U units, put them all in a rack, it's going to cost them a lot of power, uh, a lot of space, a lot of management overhead, and that sort of stuff. Um, and the, the, but the big issue was that the, the amount of security you were getting from that was, was open to debate, because all of this technology is proper. It all sits there expecting SMTP on port 25, it all sits there expecting uh, HTTP on port 80 or port 443. Um, it's not network aware. It's, again, abiding by these unwritten rules. So, more stuff didn't solve the problem. Um, the firewall helpers, as, as we like to call them, have a limited view of traffic uh, because they are poor bound. Complex and costly to buy and maintain. Um, you know, most people understand their firewalls. I mean, I've worked in the industry for sort of 15 years myself. Um, most people understand their firewalls to about 75%. There's uh, so occasionally I've gotten that. IPS is much less well known. People tend to set and forget the IPS technology. So they didn't really understand that. And again, the AV and the UFO, there's always an area of grey. You know, I spend a lot of time talking to network administrators, saying to those sort of guys, look, you know, what, what do you want this stuff to do? And you know, it's the, usually the question that comes back is, well, what, what can it do? And that's because within the network, there's always a grey element. There's always a, a level of uncertainty and doubt about what type of traffic's going across and what the feature and functionality of the model. And that was particularly relevant with this sort of setup where you daisy chain you know various products together to deliver your security. Um, the fun thing is obviously none of this addresses applications. 
So you know, none of this really is going to give you any any control over stuff like aperture. It's not going to help you control Dropbox. It's not going to do spider rope iTunes, all that kind of stuff, terribly well. Um, that was a problem. Now, back in the turn of the century, there was a company called WatchGuard who came out with this this stuff called UTM. Uh, Checkpoint and Semantic did jump on it quite highly. And there is a technology out there called Unified Threat Management. Um, what is UTM? Now, a lot of people do look at Palo Alto and look at UTM and go, well, what's, what's the difference? There are some fundamental differences. Um, and it comes from, uh, I guess the best way of saying it is an ideology. It's probably not a great word, actually, but uh, we'll go with that. So basically, UTM was designed. They, they looked at the small to medium enterprises, and they sort of said, oh, hold on, UTM, these are they need a firewall. Obviously, the small to medium businesses need a firewall. Uh, they need some URL filtering, they need some antivirus, they need some other bells and whistles. They really slap it all in a box uh, and charge them about $30,000 for it. Then we don't leave any money on the table. And that was very much, you know, and I, I don't want to beat up checkpoint, um, that was very much the idea. What you would find is is that the, the security appliances here were just co-located in one box, um, which was nice from a certain point of view. Uh, but from a performance point of view, and from a joined up security uh, strategy point of view, it uh, wasn't so great. These individual things were basically silent. So you were still running a URL filtering process. You were still running a antivirus process. You're still running a file process, so on and so forth. Um, but it just happened to be all in the same box. It's all just co-located. It didn't really address any of the issues. You know, these solutions have no more understanding of you know the way the network works or the internet works than uh, than, than this solution. It just happens to be in the same bit of tin, um, and the overhead and the management was reduced a little bit. But you know, because the corners had to be cut, um, you've got to remember that state inspection um, firewalls, you know, do a job, and then loading it all onto one box, you, you are going to hit performance issues, and to address performance issues. Security vendors um, who have grown their products organically, as is as is the case here, tend to cut corners. <laughs> so you know, if, if you have to performance versus security is is generally the balance. In this model, in the previous model, in this sort of model, it wasn't such an issue. In this model, where you're collating it, that performance issue is absolutely paramount, um, and that was why UTM, um, even today, is largely positioned against small to medium enterprises. Um, they, you know, they they sort of assume that you know, people don't care so much. You know, they've got limited funds, and, and they don't need don't need particularly the performance, which you know, in the in the case of Palo Alto, it's not true. It's just just not true. Um, so what was the answer? Make the firewall do its job, um, and so this is what Palo Alto set out. All these things we set out to address. You know, I've talked about the app ID stuff, you know, identify the applications regards to the protocol or whether it's a certain or not. Identify and control users regardless of IP address. Now, the slide base doesn't actually touch on this too much at this stage. So I say that, you know, one of the key areas that Palo Alto wanted to address with the firewall was the ability to rather than just say, you know, this range of IP addresses or that range of IP address, this sub or whatever, go into the internet for these particular applications allow. What we wanted to say was, hey, you know, the, the finance group, the legal department, the um, the the sales department, marketing department, you know, these people have different uses for the internet, uh, and the only way we know them is by the AD membership, you know, the, what Citrix server they connect to. You know, we know their usernames, we know their user groups. Wouldn't it be great if a firewall could control the traffic, control the applications uh, based on that basis? Rather than you know assuming that Fred is always going to be on uh, you know 10.10.10.1 .10 .10 every time. So being able to identify users regardless of the IP address, the expiration device, all that stuff. Predicting known and unknown application-born threats. Now that's a, a kind of a kind of a, a strange thing to say, um, and it is it's one of those things that's much easier to demonstrate than it is to talk about. Suffice to say that if you imagine a firewall that can see all the traffic all the time and it's sampling the data then it's very easy for our firewall to sort of flag up stuff it doesn't understand. Um, one of the things about more traditional firewalls and IPS technology is if it sees something it doesn't understand, it will ignore it. And that's because, you know, the technologies are 
not actually capable of seeing all the traffic, not actually capable of identifying traffic they don't understand. So it's kind of a subtlety, um, and perhaps we'll touch on it a bit later, but you know, protecting against known and known application dawn threats is kind of central. If you if you know if you look at your firewall as part of an arm race against you know the malware and the, the, the threats and the viruses and everything else that's out there, um, then this this kind of statement and being able to deliver on this kind of sentence is very important. Um, we'll come back to it. Find great visibility and control over applications access and functionality. You know, like I said, we can allow Facebook and block posting with our WebEx and sort of this stuff. Sort of that sort of stuff is is absolutely crucial. Um, you know, being able to say that certain types of users can do certain things on the internet and others can't, you know, is what everybody wants, isn't it? The final thing is the multi-gigabit low latency uh, inline deployment. Um, it's fine if you've got all these bells and whistles. It's fine if you have a, a file with all these functions, all these tick boxes that you you want to switch on. Um, it's not much use if you do switch them all on. The, the box grinds to a grinds to a, a pathetic halt. Um, so one of the design goals for Palo Alto was because we're a new company. We were born in 2005. Um, we needed a scope of the problem. So we basically chucked enough silicon at the at the problem to be able to deliver a solution that could do precisely what it said in the box. If you want to control those, if you want to control these things on, as long as we know how much bandwidth you you require out of it, then we can size the box for you and, and deliver. So all these things were important, and that is exactly what we set out to do. Um, and that's one of the things, you know, these these are things that made Palo Alto so successful. So this is one of the things that uh, uh, technology talks about. And I think this is a, on an introductory slide, sort of quite difficult to sort of enumerate. Is but I'll say it now, and, and maybe people will, will get it later. Is that you know applications, and when I talk about applications, I am talking about LinkedIn, Twitter, Rapid Share, you send it up, and that sort of stuff. When I'm talking about those things are not threats. Now I've said it before. You know there is nothing inherently wrong with Facebook chat. Um, when you look at other technologies, our competitors, and that sort of thing, what they are saying to you is you want to block it. You, you don't really care about it. I just want to block Facebook. I just want to block Twitter. I just want to block LinkedIn. I just want to block Oracle, SAP, all this stuff. In the model that our competitors have used, they have developed this mentality whereby they just want to block stuff. Traffic comes in through the firewall, hits the IPS, and the IPS can only do one thing. An intrusion prevention system prevents intrusions. Now, that might sound a bit uh, condescending, but you know, the, by implementing applications or control of applications in an IPS, all you're saying is, I'm preventing this intrusion, i.e. I'm blocking stuff. Um, and that's not how you safely enable something. A firewall enables traffic to go through it, right? I mean, you have a firewall, you specify I want to allow Facebook through it. It's, you know, I'm saying Facebook, I'm saying SMT, you know, you control that stuff in a firewall. It stands to reason. You don't control it in an IPS that is exclusively looking for problems to kill. Uh, and that's the model that all our, 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 our competitors do. That's got ramifications. So two separate policies, you know, you're, it's uh, what they've done is enormously complicated. I think uh, one of the nice things about Palo Alto is you go experience on any other traditional farm. Um, you know, regardless of it's Cisco, Juniper, and all those sort of guys, if you've got experience on any one of those firewalls and you walk up to one of ours, you are in a position where you can start to work with it immediately. You know, there's no separate GUI. You know, there's no separate log database. You know, there's no you know, there's no confusion there from a from a regular firewall user's point of view. You walk up to Palo Alto. It's very straightforward and it makes logical sense. Not the same can be said um, about a lot of the competitors. So why I see we're missing a slide there, but the point is that we control this application <coughs> actually in the file. So enabling applications using content, this is pretty much everything I've been saying. You know, you can specify groups of users, you can say I'm going to allow certain type of applications through, I'm going to control elements of that. And then I'm going to specify which users can actually do it. So you know, you can see that I'm going to allow Gmail for these types of users to block viruses. I'm going to allow you to use these applications to take away the things I'm afraid of. Uh, making the file business then what to so just to really a recap. So applications, enablement begins with application classification by app ID. You know, not these things aren't just HTTP. If you had to install Facebook as a 
fully blown executable. You know, that's the way you would think of it. You would think of it as an application. Uh, because you know, there's chat function, mail function, posting function, goodness knows what else function in there. Um, these applications do need to be classified and controlled. Users, um, tying using devices with regards to location to applications with user ID and global protection. We haven't talked about uh, user ID or global protection in terms. So user ID is a technology name we have for identifying users. And we don't care if you're sat on an AD server, you're sat on a, a Citrix server, an LDAP server, a radio server. Uh, whether we have to WMI probe your, your machine, whatever, we will endeavor to find out how the user is so we can build the security policies based on that rather than just on, a, on, a, on an IP address. Global Protect is a mobile, is a mobile sort of side to that. And what makes that interesting is that you know, when you start looking at things like uh, bring your own device, that sort of stuff, people want to work from home, you know, people want to be able to switch on their, their, their mobile phone and get access to corporate resources and that sort of stuff. That's essentially what Global Protect does. The other nice thing that Global Protect does is posture check the device. So in terms of, you know, perhaps you've got an Android device, you want to connect that Android device to the corporate network, has it been routed? You know, do you want to stop people you know, using certain types of application from the Android device? Do you want to stop people um, also for iOS stuff and Android using itself, so it also applies to, to iOS. But do you want to control how people use those devices, um, or how they, those devices use a network, I should say, regardless of where they are using using that technology, then yes, this is, this is what we do. The final thing is scanning content and pretending against threats, both known and unknown, with content ID and Wi-Fi. So content ID is basically your up filtering. Um, we have a database on the box that allows you to uh, filter out undesirable websites. I think it's the best way of putting it. Um, we have the ability to block viruses. We have the ability to block spy, excuse me, spyware, um, you know, command and control sessions. We have DLP, so we can look at keywords within data. And we can also control file types as well. So you know, all those elements go together. And once you've bonded you know, the application to the user and uh, washing away the, the bad stuff or the stuff you want to control that. The final point on that is wildfire. Palo Alto has, has sort of um, taken control, dominated, um, fairly aggressive sounding terms, but thing of the Gartner Magic Quadrant, um, for our ability to, to visualize the future of IT security, I guess that's part one of that, mm -hmm. uh, part two of it is to actually execute on that. So, you know, we've put a lot of innovations in the file that competitors have tried to keep up with, um, and wildfire has been a big big part of that. What it is is basically a sandbox in technology. So the, the firewall will monitor the download of executables um, regardless of where they come from and run them in a sandbox. Once it's identified that you know it changed certain parameters within this virtual sandbox, so it perhaps changed the, the routing table, it changed Internet Explorer settings, it killed the task manager, this sort of stuff, it will alert administrators to issues um, uh, that may or unknown issues or unknown viruses that may have become uh, alive on the network. No, it's not a, not a terribly good sort of example, but suffice to say that it is it's a standard part of our firewall, and you know it's quite an innovative way of covering over the gaps or or you know solving the problem or fixing the problems with antivirus. Um, there are a large number of issues out there regarding you know, how many samples antivirus companies have to see before they write a signature for it. How do we deal with you know the types of threats where they were very targeted? How do we have complete coverage of malware? You know where traditional antivirus vendors don't have the means, the mechanisms, the willpower to actually fix this sort of stuff uh, with traditional sort of signature-based AV. Wildfire is is essentially our ability to address that. Um, single pass platform architecture. Oh, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Um, the box is very fast, it's very custom built. What you can take away, you have a control plane and a data plane. Control plane is about management of the device. Data plane is about you know, the firewall, the firewall and sort of functionality, the IPS and that sort of stuff. Um, what's nice about the architecture is that if the firewall is under heavy load, and then maybe the denial service taking place, maybe there's just a lot of traffic going on, you can still manage it. If you ask the management server to uh, to generate a report, then uh, it doesn't impact the the file. Um, and because it's all baked into silicon, because it's all single pass, 
because there's not separate processes running for all these different features and functionality, we can be very reliable, very consistent on the throughput figures that we produce out there. So if we sell a box that sort of say, right, this box can do two gig of throughput, then guess what? It can do two gig of throughput. We sell you a box that can do uh, five gig of, of IPS and threat coverage, then yeah, guess what? It can do that. And that's because of this architecture, because it was designed from the ground up to be able to do this. Not like competitors, which, you know, some of them are at 15 years old now, they, they've grown organically. They can't make the same promises um, about their about their products. Um, I should point out that we are a regular firewall. So if your um, boilerplate for a regular firewall is Cisco ASA, or if it's uh, you know Juniper firewall or something like that, can you can Palo Alto do all those other firewall things that I'm used to having and I must have in my firewall for it to integrate with my network? Absolutely, we can. Um, you know, VPN support, quality of service support, high availability, virtual systems. The answer. Is a, is a yes, we have answers and, and solutions for all those things. Up the right hand side there you can see a, a range of boxes um, and we have a, a box for every every environment. The um, the one that's missing off there is the VM appliance. So we do actually now have a, uh, a VMware version of our firewall that can be loaded onto an ESX or ESX. So it's and provide exactly the same features and functionality we have feature pack around there across um to provide security in those sort of traffic in those sort of environments. Um, so there's the virtualized platform one. Um, that's just sort of basically how you size it. I'm not going not to dwell on that slide too much. Just be aware that you know traditional firewall, this sort of thing is what we say is north to south. This is perimeter sort of protection. This is protecting your your land from your data center, your data center from the internet, the internet from the data center. So, um, that's what we call north to south traffic. The, the VM appliance is very much focused on the east to west traffic. So on your ESX host, you might have a um, might have an SQL database and a web server, an application server. How do you control the traffic between them? You know, the hacker might go straight to the application server. That kind of makes sense for him to do that. But how do I protect the SQL server and the web server from the application server should it be compromised? Um, that's the sort of question that the, the VM appliance is, is targeted towards helping with. Um, Enterprise-wide, so these are the type of uh, environments it can be fitted into, perimeter, the data center, this part of enterprise. Uh, perimeter stuff's fairly standard, most people are familiar with that. Data center, um, there's an absolute need for a firewall in a data center. The, the problem has been that the, you know, the firewalls that have been available sort of pre-Palo Alto have not in the slightest been engineered towards that sort of environment, and therefore most people have been put off. We're going to focus now on, on application based, not on IP. You know, we have a sorry, application based, not on sort of traditional port numbers. We have a user control in there. Um, you know, it's far more simple the performance is there. It's a lot better in the data set sort of environment. And then the distributed enterprise, um, consistent network security everywhere. You know, not everyone has one site. I think that's you know, reasonable to say. Palo Alto has a a way of securing um, not only mobile users, but mobile sites and, and these sort of distributed environments, making sure that they get the coverage for, for all things we've talked about. Um, addresses the three kids. Well, safety enabled application can prevent threats, simplify security architecture, I think I'll pretty much labeled them labeled to death, so we'll move on from that one. Um, this is the validation. So, you know, Parata Networks there in the in the top right of the magic quadrant. Um, there is an we did start down uh, one one quadrant below um, as visionaries that were able to execute. I think uh, three or four years ago now, um, and we've gradually made our way up. And what's happened is you know people at like Cisco, Juniper, Checkpoint, Fortinet, all those sort of guys who are sort of traditional competitors have moved backwards. That's because you know they've been taking a lot of money. Um, and renewals and support and whatever else, and have not been reinvesting it back into security. Um, and Palo Alto came out, we have reinvested in security, we have um, made massive changes to the way the firewall works, even between our own firewall. You know, I joined Palo Alto three years ago, and it was between version three and, and the version published on now, absolutely, you know, apples and pears in terms of features and, and functionality. So we have been moving forward, and it's recognized by partner. Um, it's not just Gartner, so Gartner, Forrester, we had an independent test by Network World, which is pretty good. NSS tests, you know, all these people have, have pretty much recognized that, you know, the file's changed um, and, and Palo Alto 
has changed it and changed it for the better. Um, and you can you can take a look at these and and get their view on that. Um, so that's it for the presentation side. Uh, is anyone from from Prodec there? Do we have time for a quick um, quick demo of the product? Yeah, we've got a couple of minutes, Will. So go for it if you want to. Uh, we've got a demo box in Brussels, so what we'll do is do a very quick demo of, uh, it just demonstrates the visibility you get out of Palo Alto and forms what might be considered a, a minor miracle in, in certain circles. So there's a box in Brussels, we connect to it, it's basically traffic runs through it all the time, um, and it's a PCAP that we got, so it's, a, it's a, basically a network recording that we endlessly replay through the firewall, and it gives you a clue as to what a, a really real firewall would look like in production. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to data mine the firewall using this thing called the Application Command Center, it's the ACC. And it's going to present the top 25 sessions going through the firewall in the last hour. So it's going to show me all the applications, top 25 applications seen in the last hour, uh, web browsing, DNS, NTP, FTP, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's also seeing there stuff like Yahoo Mail, Microsoft updates, uh, Google Analytics is up there, and also you've got things like insufficient information, unknown new things. That's the firewall basically saying, oh, I don't understand, um, you know, can you add this application, can you tell me what this is, what should I be doing with them in that regard. Each application is a risk rating, so each application is this number, it's just a number. Um, all the number says is, guess what, web browsing, uh, due to the fact you know, there's problems associated with web browsers, there's time wasting, there's malware, there's bandwidth usage. Web browsing is far more risky um, than ping. That's it. It's just a number. That number is aggregated into this number up here. So the 3.8 there, I uh, just aggregate those figures there, and that's just a number. If you go into the office every day and your Palo Alto says 3.8, 3.7, 3.9, then it's business usual, nothing to worry about. If it spikes up to 5, which is the top end of the scale, then hey, guess what? You've got a problem. If it's bikes down to zero, you're probably unemployed uh, as a net is dead. And that's really, really all it's useful for. So you get the applications, you get some URL filtering. Um, like I said, we have a, a URL categorization database on the firewall. And it's just looking at HTTP headers for all sessions going, all right, guess what? That website, that application was web-based email. It was uh, social networking. It was education institutions. Um, so it's just calling out the, the categories. You then got threat information. So this is, you know, spyware, modern malware, vulnerabilities, uh, kind of thing that an IPS would produce, your antivirus would produce. And it's just showing you the top 25 ones. You've got critical low and high ones. Uh, ranging things like login failed there. So you've got FTP failed login to you know, virtual Mundo phone homes. So that's a piece of spyware, isn't it? Uh, and you've got code execution there with Adobe. So it's different types of vulnerabilities that one will see across all ports. The, the final thing it's pulling out is data filtering. So this is the firewall saying, you know, guess what I saw? Windows executable 588 times. Um, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Word, well, it's seeing all those things. It's also pulling out keywords. So it's looking for the word teacher in this case. Um, it's also pulling out the word... <laughs> it's also pulling out the word confidential, and it's also pulling out credit card filters as well. So. That's, that's that side of things. Now, what you can do with this is you can pick on them. So I'm going to pick on BitTorrent. Maybe you've got an organization, this is your firewall, and your, your Palo Alto is telling you that, oh, guess what, I saw I saw BitTorrent. Um, now, I could have picked on a threat, I could have picked on a virus, I could have picked on a URL category or anything, all like that. I'm just going to investigate in this instance in BitTorrent. It tells me what BitTorrent is, which is fine. It tells me what ports it run over, and this is why Historically, traditional IPS and typical firewalls have struggled um, with controlling BitTorrent and on Skype, and on LimeWire, that sort of stuff. It's because there is no port number associated with it. And a port-dependent firewall can't control this. It tells you why it's got such a high risk rating, it's capable of transfer files, malware, evasive, so on and so forth. And you can click on the Google or Wikipedia page to get some more information. What I've then got is top application is BitTorrent, and that's because I clicked on BitTorrent, so I just went to columns there. What I then get is some host name information, some IP address information, I'm also getting user information, and a number of bytes. So even looking at that, I can see that Tim Dyke, this fellow here, is the, the most prolific user of BitTorrent. Um, and he's acting as a source, so he's a, 
it is the ones initiating BitTorrent sessions effectively for downloading servers. Um, you then got the top destinations. These are people receiving BitTorrent sessions, and again, I've got IP addresses, usernames. I've got a nice good graph that once again highlights Tim Dyke as a as a sort of problem user when it comes to BitTorrent. I can see any countries associated with it. This isn't too great. I mean, for, for BitTorrent, obviously BitTorrent grabs a little bit of the file from all over the place. Um, if I clicked on a virus, this might be more information. If I had clicked on a piece of confidential data, that might have been more relevant here. You know, guess what? If you uh, if you set up a keyword search for a particular customer or a piece of a particular piece of information, and you see you're going to China and you don't deal with China, and guess what? You've got a problem. But you can at least see this. You know, no other firewall allows you this level of information. If you had to go to your to the traditional IPS, I guess, dealt with BitTorrent a little bit, firewalls dealt with IPS. You know, being able to figure out which user has got the most in what has been little over two clicks is kind of a minor miracle. Um, I can pick on a user, so if I pick on this user here, it puts the, uh, the username of this filter here in the top left. It changes the, the port to reflect that this is all the stuff that uh, MediProte, the user I picked on, MediProte has been using BitTorrent. That may not, may not be interesting. Maybe I've clicked on a zip file. Maybe I should have asked. Now I would know how many, how many zip files he sends out, that sort of stuff. Um, in this case, BitTorrent is not too interesting. But if I remove BitTorrent from the filter, I can immediately then start to see uh, you know, everything that this particular user has done in the last hour. I might say to myself, oh, just a minute. I, I don't allow Hotmail. And I can then start perhaps investigating Hotmail. I can, you know, Within five clicks, I've identified that you know, BitTorrent is the problem user. I've then found out that there's another application on the network I'm not allowing, and then I can see you know, in a couple of minutes all the people on my network that are perhaps using Hotmail. So there you go. That's kind of cute. Um, the other thing that I can do in addition to doing this, you know, and, and keep in mind that you know, to be able to figure out this, I, I'd have to examine the firewall logs, maybe I'd have to examine the IPS, I certainly have to investigate the URL filter or the proxy logs, um, which take me more than sort of the three clicks I've gone through here. Um, I can at any point dive into the sort of traditional firewall logs and start getting you know, source port and destination and all manner of information. There's a PCAP there. So what I can do is go from you know, a 30,000 mile view of the, the network, the traffic that's actually live going through the firewall right now, um, and zoom in within a half a moment to very detailed information. So rather than, you know, right now with a lot of technologies, firewall administrators just open up ports. You know, they get a call, they change requests, they, they have to you know, allow, allow Oracle on port, whatever. Um, and there's not really much of a security function that you're just an opening and closing ports. Um, with the Palo Alto stuff, what's nice is that you can be very proactive. You know, if if there was you'd gone through this and you'd noticed that a particular user from I don't know, let's pick on South Korea from the South Korean office was uploading a 600 meg AVI every Wednesday, is this legitimate? Is it not legitimate? Who knows? Who would even see it? Um, with ours, you know, that sort of activity is very very obvious very easy to investigate and very easy to then remediate. You know, I just went into an organization and they had that issue, how to have people share these huge files. You know, then you can start looking at web 2.0 and saying, right, we're going to use you send it. Get a corporate account that we're going to limit it to these particular users. They can only send these type of files and hey, they can only send it this time of day. So you know you go from a position with traditional sort of technology where you know the amount of visibility you've got is, is limited by the reports you're getting, limited by the, the visibility, limited by the technology itself. Um, to a Palo Alto sort of place where you know what you're getting all the visibility, you're seeing all the ports, all the users, all the information, all of the time. Um, and then feeding that back proactively into the into the company. So then before you know you're improving your company's security posture um, rather than like I say being largely with the traditional stuff slightly in the dark. And that's the point of that demo. So that's uh, I don't want to I don't want to dwell on that any any longer than I really have to. I really encourage people to get a POC. Um, it's fairly easy to get uh, hands on one of our boxes. Um, the guys at 
codec will, will make sure that they facilitate that and you'll get an engineer on site. In a couple of hours we can we can generate a report like this on, on pretty much any, any network out there. And we can do it transparently too, so it can go uh, out of band on the network almost, so on a tap port, it just snips the traffic and within a couple of hours you get a report on your network. So that's, uh, that's that. Um, as far as demo goes, I don't want to spend too much time on it. I hope, I hope it was at least interesting. Um, just with that, I think that's that's me done. It's very difficult to, to know when you can't see people's faces. Uh, so thank you very much for listening. Uh, thank you very much indeed for the uh, for the product guys helping me out here. And with that, I'll I'll hand you back to product. Thank you very much, Will. Uh, very interesting. It's great to be able to see the the uh, firewall in action and to be able to see how simple it is to get. Um, information with just a few clicks of a mouse you can delve right into uh, a problem and have an answer to it within minutes. Um, thank you for your time uh, everyone who's attended the uh, webinar today and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. If there's any questions please give us a call. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. <laughs>